I'm in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 11 through 25. Book of Hebrews, remember, is a book. It's written to people. It's written to the people of God. It's written to the people of God who have been given the message of Jesus, um, but something has happened along the way, and as they are journeying in their life uh, toward a city um, that is not built with hands, that it's written to pilgrim people, as if this were a pilgrim's progress book for people who are looking for that city, who've been promised an inheritance, um, that tense in that city um, is the heavenly city. It's the city of Christ, but it seems like along the way, people have come, uh, certainly in the book of Hebrews, uh, uh, religious uh, type people, and there's a danger, there's warnings given um, in this beautiful, beautiful book about people's hearts hardening. Um, what are they hardening Toward and, and I think in, in the passages we've, we've covered, um, we, we begin to see it because the danger for um, these people is they are starting to risk, um, risk this idea by giving up what God has done for them in Christ. And in the book of Hebrews, going back to an old faith and old ways, walking away from Jesus is the, is the warning of the book of Hebrews. They're walking away from Jesus. And so one of the reasons that Jesus is so beautiful in the book of Hebrews is the author is saying, you mean to tell me you're going to walk away from this? You're going to walk away and harden your hearts toward the idea that Jesus plus nothing is everything. The idea that it is finished. And if we'd read the first part of chapter 10, which we didn't, what they were turning to um, was, was hard because they were turning back to their old faith. And not only was it not helping them, if you read the first few verses of chapter 10, it was making them worse. The law had come, um, and, and the law provided and exposed a reality, um, and the old way had come. But the old way couldn't even make a dent. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. And so the, the author of Hebrews, actually I think in chapter 10, he's getting to the point where he seems really frustrated um, with the people of God, almost exasperated, like, what are you doing? You keep turning back um, against something, one, that can only make it worse. In fact, um, the old way, the old law, the old thing, not only doesn't help you, it actually heightens your awareness of your issue. And instead of, it, when it heightens your awareness and the law heightens your issue, you turn to yourselves and you don't turn to Christ, um, beating yourselves. But yet their hearts were becoming more and more hardened against Jesus more and more turned back to the old way of doing things. Really, the book of Hebrews chapter 10 is that really the old way, apart from Christ, nothing is ever enough. Nothing is ever enough. We're always chasing enough. And you know, in not only my tradition, but Probably a lot of our traditions, we were rightfully told, you know, that the things we chase apart from Christ will never be enough. You know, we chase sex in all of its broken forms and it's never enough. We chase the bottle, it's never enough. We chase another hit. Or another high, or another calm, and it's not enough. You know, the big one growing up is we chase money, and it's not enough. And none of those things are enough. But what happens, though, and what is happening here is one becomes redeemed, one becomes um, uh, to know Jesus. And, and what I've noticed over my years in ministry is I think, you know, if we were in a good evangelical church and um, I, 
I let everyone know that sex isn't enough, the bottle isn't enough, drugs are not enough, money is not enough. We would all go a hearty amen, and we would preach it, brother, preach it, preach it, preach it. We would all be doing that. Yet what has happened in the church of Christ is, one, it's all true. That's never enough. It will never satisfy. Those things only lead to death. They only lead to destruction. But what happens is, is we become, as they did, into a religious world, and we just trade our enoughs. And it all sounds so spiritual. Have I read the word enough? Have I prayed enough? Have I fasted enough? I mean, you could name, and all, all of those things are good things, right? Should we pray? Yes. Should we read the Bible? Yes. Do I have enough of the right beliefs? That's big in our tradition. Am I right about baptism? Am I enough right about baptism? And am I enough right about the table? Am I enough right about our election? Am I enough right about all of those things? And we start to categorize people with people we think they're enough. You know, another big one, even in our days, is they say, no, 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 no. We know, we know that none of that stuff counts. That performance doesn't count. But here's what, are you willing enough? Are you willing enough? Because after all, the Holy Spirit, he wants to come and he wants to fill you. And you can only be a vessel for him if you're willing enough. It all sounds really spiritual. Still the same thing. Am I enough? Am I willing enough? We just want to chase it and chase it and chase it. That's where we are today and I'm going to read through this, and I'm going to read through one slide at a time because I'm just going to preach. This text preaches itself, so I'm going to try to just kind of get out of the way of the text for the most part um, this morning and um, just read. Uh, read it. So this is Hebrews 10, 11 through 25. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, which can't put a dent in anything. You got to capture what the author is trying to say here. Day after day, the priest stands and performs his religious duties. And it's not just day after day. He does the same thing again and again and again. And what makes this so crazy is the priest does it day after day after day. And he does it again and again and again. And nothing's accomplished. <laughs> I mean, the author is trying to pull you in. And see, it doesn't matter if you repeat it day after day after day, the religious duties and, and the sacrifices of the old faith. And it doesn't matter not only if you do it day after day, but you do it again after again after again. It doesn't put a dent into the sin problem. Take away sin. And we have the beautiful butts of Scripture. But when this priest, Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and now he waits to make his enemies his footstool. footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. These two verses, these two contrasts are meant to go back to back. Yo, go, go back. I'm not, not ready to, to go back uh, to the... To the next slide. Day after day, again and again, nothing's ever accomplished. But there's a priest, and his name is Jesus, who just once, not again and again and again and again, but once offered for all time. One sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. He then awaits for his enemies to be made his footstool. And this one time that only happens once, this one sacrifice, he does, it worked. <laughs> 
He made us perfect, and he didn't just make us perfect till the next time we applied the sacrifice. He didn't just make it perfect. It's one for all time, and we are made perfect, past tense, forever. You're meant to see the contrast that Jesus isn't just greater than the old way. He's supersized greater than the old way. He doesn't even compare to the old way. The old way failed. It was just a shadow to point us to Jesus. Well, they did it day after day after day. He did it for one time. And you know what? His one time, his one time sacrificed, perfected forever all of us who are being made holy, it's kind of this, this, this idea that we're, we're in this, this journey. And yes, we're, we're being perfected, but we are already perfected. It is a done work because he who has begun a good work in you, you can be confident that he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. One of the reasons I know, I know in the big, uh, big word of, of, of our um, of, in, in our language of growing in Christ is this word sanctification. One reason I know you all, one, you all are already sanctified. Yes, you are being sanctified, but I know it will be completed because right now Jesus is praying for you. You don't even need me praying for you. He's praying for you. And for who Jesus prays, it will happen. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And one last thing before I move on to the next slide that I think is the big image picture here. Day after day, the priest stands and performs his religious duty. What is Jesus doing? He's sitting. He's sitting. You know why he's sitting? Because it is finished. It's done. The priest stands. Day after day after day. And Jesus, one sacrifice, once for all, does it. And he sits down because he's done. That's how done it is. And it is so done that we are perfected forever. Now that's pretty incredible to believe. And we don't necessarily like hearing that kind of news all the time. That news actually makes us a little scared sometimes because it actually seems possible. We're perfected forever already. It's already done. You know what? We're going to struggle to believe that. And you know what? The author, he understands that. He says, you know what? You might believe this is crazy. You might believe this is preposterous. So next slide. We're going to need some help to believe this. So who do we have to help us believe that? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time. Says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. So the Holy Spirit has taken what the old was and he's written it on our hearts and he's written it on our minds. I don't know. And it's very interesting because actually when you read this text, the emphasis about what the Holy Spirit is doing, the first part is being added, yes, the, the law still exists. Yes, the law is still written in our hearts and minds. Yes, the law comes and reminds us what God desires and what God wants. But then he says the Holy Spirit adds. This is the thing we, we struggle to believe. This is what the Holy Spirit adds. That their sins and lawless acts, God will remember no more. You see, it takes a supernatural whole. You want to know what the Holy Spirit he helps me and you remember that God will remember our sinless and lawless acts no more. That's great news. But that takes a work of the Holy Spirit for us actually to rest in that. That their sins, our sins, and everyone this morning has things that you may be have done. There are things that some of you, probably all of us, have done in our past that sit in our hearts and we wonder, will God ever truly forgive me for that? Yes, one sacrifice, once for all. And if you are struggling with that as one of his children... I pray, along with the Holy Spirit, that the power of the Holy Spirit would reveal to you that your sin, 
and all of your lawless acts, God remembers no more. Only the work of the Holy Spirit could ever convince us of that. You want to know what the role of the Holy Spirit is? The role of the Holy Spirit is to convince us that our sins and lawless acts are remembered no more from God. It's a beautiful thing. Next line. So here's the truth. The priest does it day after day. <laughs> the sacrifice by Jesus is once for all. We're perfected. We're going to have a hard time believing that. The Holy Spirit comes, helps us believe that. What are the consequences of that? What is it? And these next four views say, that because they don't do it day after day, because it's been done once for all, because we have been perfer perfected forever, because we've been given the Holy Spirit to help us believe all of that, we're free. What are we free to do? And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sins is no longer, is, is, is no longer necessary. So where sins have been forgiven, since he remembers our lawless deeds no more, the sacrifice, this performance is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I just have two things. We have confidence. I'm going to just touch briefly on that. We have confidence to enter the most holy place. That's the place that... Um, in the Old Testament was a place where the basin was, but now it's the holy place, it's heaven itself by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty, actually evil conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Stay on that slide. I'm not going to go uh, to the next one yet. Because we don't do it day after day. Because we have a high priest who's done it once for all. Because the Holy Spirit has been given to us to convince us of that. This word keeps coming up. up in Hebrews 4 because that is true we can have confidence you can't read Hebrews you know Hebrews is full of warnings Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 are pretty severe warnings if you you want to, to go read them um, and they're severe warnings about turning away from Christ but if you read the tenor of the book of Hebrews and the whole of the book of Hebrews, that even, yes, in the midst of those warnings that are rejection for those whose hearts are becoming hardened toward Jesus, if this is true with Jesus, he wants us to know the author of Hebrews is not trying to get us to doubt. He wants us to have confidence. In fact, the last verse there says that we will have full assurance of our faith. We can be confident in Hebrews 4 that we can go boldly to the throne of grace. We can be fearless. There is something about this once for all high priest sacrifice that allows us to be full of confidence. And that is the, the role that um, I believe the minister of Christ as we leave here is to give you confidence, assurance, not assurance in what you're doing. And, and here's our struggle because... We don't believe, oh, go to the next slide. We're, we're on to the next slide, the, the one that, the, right there. Um, we have confidence. We have assurance. You know why we are so unconfident? You know why the church struggles with its confidence? You know why you individually struggle with your confidence? You know, we hear this message of Christ and we think it's great that it is finished and then someone comes along and say, oops, there's more. You know why we lose confidence? Because we seek our assurance in our fruit. And we're actually taught that. We don't have faith 
in the finished work of Christ, we're created to have faith in our obedience. And when your faith is in your obedience, you will lose all confidence. The author of Hebrews is saying your confidence and your faith is in the one who sat down and perfected you once for all. It is not in your obedience. It is not in your performance. It's in his promises. We have full assurance that faith brings in his promises to cleanse us from the guilty conscience. And by the way, that word guilty, evil conscience is this reality that our conscience is always condemning us. That's what happens. You know what happens when your faith is in your obedience? You're caught in the never enough world. Did I pray enough this morning? I could have prayed more. Should I have watch a football game this afternoon or should I not watch a football game this afternoon? How much should I read? What if I didn't get this right? What if I didn't get that right? Our faith and our assurance comes into needing to be enough. And the author of Hebrews says, no, you have confidence and you have full assurance because of what Jesus did. And this is a beautiful passage. I mean, he's making it abundantly clear that that is the confidence by which um, we, we have. You know, our conscience accuses us and the evil one's name is the accuser. And we take that to the one who sits at the throne of grace. And every misstep we have, we live in fear. And we lack full assurance and confidence because we're looking at our own faithfulness instead of his. But not only will this truth bring us confidence, us free. Next slide. Next slide. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who is promised is faithful. What do we hold to? His, his faithfulness. We hold to the one who's promised. He is faithful. And let us then consider, knowing that, knowing that he sits, knowing that I and you are perfectly going to be set apart and made by his work, knowing that we can have full confidence and assurance to him, it then frees you and I to turn our eyes outward toward others. You see, if our faith is in our obedience, guess where my eyes are going to be all the time? On myself. But if I know that's taken care of, let's consider then how, because of that truth, how we may spur one another to love and good deeds, how we can encourage one another. Not giving up meeting together. You know why we gather? We gather so that we will spur one another on to love and good deeds. We will gather to remind each other that it is finished. We will gather to remind ourselves that it is finished. And so when we bring and we come into um, worship and we've had a tough week and we've had that. This is the place where we're reminded of the one who sits. That our hearts and our minds will turn toward others. And that we will run to the place where we hear over and over again that he is the once for all sat down, sacrificed. And we need to do this because we live in the end days. We do it. We need each other. We need each other to be reminded of that. Where there is forgiveness, there is no longer need for sacrifice. Where there is forgiveness, there is no longer the need to chase enough. Because Jesus is enough. And that frees us 
to engage each other's hearts, engage each other's lives. And we can do it wherever we gather. We spur one another to love and good deeds as we worship here. If you have people in your home this week, you go to choir practice, wherever. You're spurring one another on to love and good deeds. We struggle with this message. I know we, I do. I know you. I think we actually struggle with forgiveness. I think we struggle with complete forgiveness, even though we all want it. I know in counseling, I've, I've, I've sat and listened to couples who've been through a divorce. You know, on the back end of a divorce, there's still counseling to be done, and one of the things one has to counsel through is someone living with a thought, was it my fault? Was it my fault? Was this divorce my fault? And I can sense the tension rising because they, 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 they want to be enough. Um, they're not sure they're enough. Um, they're not sure that, um, that, that they were perfect in the reality. And, and you know what they're wanting me to say? <laughs> you know what the, the cry for me to say? They're wanting, you know what they're wanting to he, me to say to them in the midst of that? Is they want me to hear the story. They want me to kind of be the judge. And they want me to say that they're okay. They want to be enough. And as I've gotten older in ministry, I hear the story. Some people never come back <laughs> to counseling or to church. And you know what I say? I'm sure some of it was your fault. But your sins are forgiven. You don't need to know you're right. What you're really wanting to know is, am I forgiven? Am I forgiven? It's hard. I do it. I was in a meeting this week. This message was already percolating and something came up in the meeting and you know, I, we always use this language here in leadership. You know, Brad, you're trying to save yourself. You're trying to save yourself. You know, you're defending. You know, you're trying to set a story straight. You're trying to do all of these things. You're trying to explain. And, you know, the sermon was percolating in my heart. And I thought, you know what? You're wanting to share so that everyone knows that you're right. Brad. Your sins are forgiven. And now I can love the individual. And I told the leadership team, man, as we catch each other doing it, as you catch your pastor doing it, someone grab me by the shirt and look me in the eyes and tell me, Brad, your sins are one sacrifice, once for all, you're free. You know, we all want, you know, even as I was sitting there, as I was going through that in the meeting, thinking, well, I don't want that because I've done nothing wrong here. What do you mean to tell me your sins are, what do you mean to tell me? Because if you're telling me my sins are forgiven, it, it, means, it means that you think I'm in the wrong here. Well, one, it doesn't necessarily mean that. But two, I think that was going on here, some of the hardest people to accept forgiveness are religious people. Because if you actually go up to some people and say your friends are, sins are forgiven, they want to go, what are you saying that to me for? Why are you saying that to me? 
And yet I believe that in all of our defense, that if we were to unpack it, that is what our hearts long for, and that's what sets us free. That's what's going to set this writer, or the people to the writer, just you and I, free here. Because at the end of the day, we even all showed up here because we just want someone to tell us our sins are forgiven. And then we can go love someone. Ernest Hemingway captures the human heart in ways he probably doesn't know, but I think, you know, he was an author who was pretty in touch because he was depressed all the time um, in his writings. But he wrote a short story um, called The Capital of the World, which was set in Madrid, Spain. And it's a, it's a story that encompasses a lot of things, but one of the main characters in that story is a, is a guy named Paco. And um, Paco has lots of issues um, in that uh, particular story. But Paco, had, you're not told in the story, but Paco somewhere along the way had done some things that caused him to be estranged from his father. And, and they, they appear in his writing to be issues that Paco had. But as life was going on, the dad couldn't find Paco, and he just wanted to find Paco and tell Paco that, he, that all's forgiven. I want relationship with you. I just want relationship with you, Paco. But find Paco, he knew Paco was in the So he actually put an ad in the paper, um, in, um, in the local paper, and said, Paco, this is your father. All is forgiven. Will you meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon tomorrow? Because I just want to restore relationship with you. At noon, the next day, dad arrives, father arrives. And there's police everywhere, and there's this massive crowd. And, um, it, you know, no one was expecting, and they were wondering what's going on. He goes, what are you, what are you doing? What, what's going on here? And... Um, um, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the mess, one of the police officers said to the father, there are 800 men named Paco here <laughs> because they just want to know that their father has forgiven him. That resonates. Because deep down, we just want to know that our Father has forgiven us. Where there is forgiveness, it is enough. So the question this morning for you and I, is what are you and I leaning into to be okay? What are we leaning into in our stories that would just make us okay? That would make us enough? That would make us whole? That would make us complete? And we all have something. We all have something that our hearts are longing for whether it's in a strained relationship with a child, whether it's to undo the past, whether it's to go back and do something over again, you know, you can fill in the blank, but what are you leaning into this morning that will just make you okay, that will make you enough, that will finally think, you know what, I won't have to worry about that anymore. I can be free to bake pies. <laughs> I can be free to love and do good deeds and to spur one another on. And it never comes. What are you leaning into? Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms, safe 
and secure from all alarm. Leaning on Jesus, he's enough. And we know he's enough because he sat down once and for all so that you are free to love your neighbor and to love him. The only way you will get to the place of loving your neighbor is that, which is why we need the Holy Spirit. It's also why Satan attacks that truth. Because if he can get us to believe that it isn't quite finished, then he has us absorbed in ourselves. It is finished. The very last words of Jesus' life the very first words of our new life in Christ because we're free.